Okie dokie. Hello, neighbors. Um, hopefully the microphone is okay. I left all last week's recommendations on volume and noise suppression in place. Um, so hopefully I should, I should sound okay. Uh, now that I've got audio stable, every time I start uh, OBS, it decides to move my head around, which is really weird. Uh, I'm liking syscalls in the chat. Pipe and MMAP. I do love MMAP. That is a fun one. Um, let's see. So topics for today are in the uh, in the about section on Twitch. Let me go get the URL for chat. Actually, copy. There. Um, mostly we're going to be talking about uh, Fortify and how it relates to a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so uh, Fortify Source is um, a feature that was developed both uh, between uh, GCC and glibc to try to deal with some of the really crappy uh, string handling routines like you know str copy and not doing bounds checking and other stuff like that so fortify adds a whole bunch of sanity checks around the arguments um, since oh, the compiler can know a lot of things about string buffers because usually they've been declared in some fashion um, so if the compiler can reason about it uh, it tries to do that um, this has grown over time um, latest GCC does even more of this checking, um, but uh, since it can actually evaluate sizes and other stuff while, while doing the build. Um, but there's also runtime checking, uh, which got, uh, which was part of it as well. So if the compiler can figure it out ahead of time, it'll warn you. Uh, and if it can't figure it out ahead of time, it'll sort of add as many of the runtime checks as it can manage. Uh, for example, if it knows what the size of the destination uh, buffer is, but it doesn't know how long the input might be at any given call, um, it'll retain that portion of it. It'll retain the, you know, oh, the buffer is only 16 bytes or whatever. We can't write more than 15 plus a null, so I'll do that runtime uh, test when it runs. But anyway, um, the kernel has an implementation of this uh, in Include Linux string. Um, so this is. I'll go down to where we've actually got a good example of it. All right, so this is using a bunch of, bunch of uh, compiler internals um, to figure out what's happening. Um, so here's string copy, uh, and we get. This is forced to be an inline function so the compiler can look at these two arguments, uh, P and Q, the destination and the source. Uh, and then there's a, a feature called built-in object size, which basically says, hey, if you know what the size of this is, please assign it to this variable. This all happens as part of the sort of inlining and optimization passes. Uh, so do you know what the actual size of P is, you know what the actual size of Q is, and um, I'm glossing over this second argument. I'll come back to that at some point. But for now, we'll just take the, the basic explanation. Um, so P and Q, what are they? And if the size isn't known at compile time, uh, the result is basically minus one. Um, so the idea here is if you've got a string copy and uh, you've done something like, you know, Five, source ten, or rather, uh, let's see, string copy into dust from. Ooh, boy. Um, when the compiler sees this, it sees DST and it says, okay, built an object size here is going to be five, and it'll, you know, do the same here. Um, so this test 
get skipped because that both both are known at compile time. And it says, well, let's look at a uh, string length of q plus one and make sure it uh, it's gonna gonna fit in there. Um, right. So I'll I'll get to the example on what happens if the destination size is unknown. Um, what's happening here is string length is actually and the note here is uh, string length and memcopy are fortified by the time we get to here. So the earlier definition of string length says, well, let me get up to it here. Um, it's trying to figure out how big is this thing and we should probably call string nlen because we know it should never go past the end of the, the known size of the buffer. Um, so this is sort of a, a safe string lang version. Um, so this won't go beyond, and memcopy will freak out if it sees it, but um, I can show you the memcopy as well. Uh, but what happens if the, um, if the sizes are unknown is it'll just call string copy directly, because there's nothing that can be done. And you might blow up, so um, it's still not a great idea to use string copy for this stuff. Um, let me show you the memcopy copy as well, so you can see where it actually does the testing. Um, so here is sort of like string copy, but we've got our destination, our source, we do the same thing. And if we say, if this size here is known constant in the compilation, then we can actually examine these sizes and say at compile time, if our destination buffer is smaller than the size we're expecting to copy into it, uh, freak out at compile time. That's what this write overflow. Uh, and if the source uh, is smaller than the size we have been asked to copy, we'd be reading past the end of the source, also freak out uh, at compile time. Uh, and if it's not a built-in constant, if size is not a built-in constant, then we sort of have the runtime versions of this, uh, where this test actually happens. At, it isn't optimized away by the compiler. Uh, because the compiler can throw out this test if, uh, if this size is not known at compile time. Um, so uh, this then says, oh no, uh, we're copying into something that's too small or we're copying out of something that is too small, freak out at runtime. Otherwise, actually do the mem copy. Mm. Greek food, yum, sorry, reading, uh, reading chat. Um, so the idea here is that those would be the compile time checks. Uh, some of this exists in GCC natively now, but uh, the kernel has a lot of weird extra helpers that aren't part of the standard uh, sort of libc spec. Um, and the the important one is let me go show do is string s copy. Sorry, there's no bots in chat yet. Um, so this is the kernel's preferred string copier, uh, which is say that it doesn't over copy, it doesn't do string lang beyond the end of a buffer like string l copy does. Um, and it tries to do other smart things. However, this, um, this string s copy, which is the preferred version, we don't actually have any uh, fortify checks for it right now. You'll notice we just do string l copy is covered in here. Uh, string copy itself is covered. Um, oh yes, word at a time constants. Um, right, this is, and this is a, it's basically trying to do an efficient word copying. Um, it's pretty wild way to go about it, but, uh, but it does work. Um, it's especially important for systems that do not have efficient unaligned accesses. So you can sort of start, if your string is off by whatever your, your native alignment is, you copy a couple bytes out first until you get lined up, and then you can start doing word at a time copies, uh, which is supposed to make this much faster. Um, and actually there are Notice uh, it should be a config wrapping it. Yeah, there may be architecture specific overrides for this. You know, if you can use, I don't know, 
know, vector instructions or something to do a string copy even faster than uh, native register word at a time stuff. So those can get overwritten. Uh, but anyway, the sort of the point is, if we go look at string L copy, um, we don't have anything that actually does the compile time fortify checks on string S copy. Uh, and GCC is really only looking for string copy and related family stuff. It doesn't know about string S copy being a thing. Uh, of course, I didn't even talk about string N copy, which is yet another point of great pain um, because that actually does padding and some other stuff. So let's go look at string L copy some more. Um, so this has been, uh, this is an, was an open issue on the kernel self-protection project issue tracker. Uh, let me go find it. Bring S copy. So we wanted to add fortify source coverage. Um, it says, uh, sorry, looking at chat. How do you run all that logic and compile time in C? Um, well, it's part of the optimization pass, basically. All the stuff where it says, you know, built-in constant or built-in object size, those are things are, that are basically handled by the optimizer after inlining. Uh, and this function is forced to be inlined. So every call site that uses one of these kinds of fortified objects will actually sort of unroll that function in place and the optimizer will try to go through and evaluate what it can keep and throw away, um, which makes this either throw compile time warnings or ditch the test completely from the final binary. Uh, and if it needs to keep the runtime test, then it does that as well. Um, so there is, there is some certainly some size, uh, image size cost to doing these inlines, uh, but there isn't an efficient way to do the runtime tests without it. Um, and yeah, we just have to deal with having coming from C's uh, relatively unsafe string handling. So that's the price we pay. Um, anyway, so uh, doing these kinds of checks with against string S copy is needed as well. We want to see the object size that we're copying into because if we can detect it at compile time, we should definitely not be you know blowing over the end of the, the end of the buffer. Um, and there wasn't initially any coverage on this. It was sort of uh, added, removed, um, some other things happened. Hold on, muting my phone. Um, uh, so that's, that's one, of the, one of the things that uh, someone, I think Lionel, let me get their name correct, um, has started looking at um, and sent a series for um, for implementing this uh, and getting some tests written for it. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, question in chat, the reason for the rename. Um, so this makes it easier to have um, uh, implementation somewhere else in the kernel that doesn't have to know about this at all. So for example, if you look at uh, lib string, let's see, that's where and the sort of default string L copy is. And if I had to go rename this to, you know, unsafe string L copy, I'd have to do it here. I'd have to do it in all of the architecture implementations um, and everywhere else. Whereas uh, being able to rename it here is sort of just a, uh, a kind of quick and dirty way to create a wrapper for it. Um, and that seems to work pretty well. Uh, I haven't seen any problems with it yet. Uh, Daniel McKay uh, did that originally. i would kind of never seen anything like that before. You can see how rename works. Um, it basically just creates a tag at the, at the sort of asm and link level, which is, I'm frankly surprised it works, but <laughs> it does. Um, Anyway, just I, I think of it as basically the quick way to do create a, a wrapper around stuff. Um, and then you get uh, these are the inlines and the others are the ones you call into through that renaming. And I 
we call it, you know, real string L copy here. Um, and then other ones we want to call the underlying mem copy without the, the checks done because we've already done the checking above it in here. Um, sometimes we, like I showed in string copy, where you depend on the mem copy fortification, and other times we've already done the work, so we can call the underlying mem copy. Uh, anyway, that's sort of how the, the wrapping works in here. Uh, so we've got we've got the new series um, from ah oh, not Lionel it's Francis Francis Laniel maybe hopefully I've got names right uh, ironically being a person with a hard to pronounce first name I can't pronounce anyone's names but I try um, anyway it's uh, it's, it's Functionally, very, <clears throat> very similar uh, wrapper. Um, he's still working on it. I give some feedback, uh, but I had, I had an old tree. Uh, let's see, fortify. Let's see where I put it. Anywhere? Let's go look where I put it. Why does it? Ah, oh, there it is. Fortify. I thought I'd call it Fortify. Fortify. Anyway, this is uh, what I had was sort of a implementation. Uh, since I was looking at this, I just did a quick copy of some simple string copies. It's certainly not sufficient, um, as Francis showed in other, uh, several other corner cases. But um, what I wanted to get into <clears throat> was, how do we test this? Like, in, in doing the review of the code, um, there was a bunch of corner cases that you know got pointed out by him and myself. Um, you can see here, let me get, let me open this. So we can actually see. So this was his original implementation, um, which sort of redoes a couple of the checks. Like we're we're looking at the e too big that comes out of string s copy. Um, it's got some issues with can't do a built-in constant on a variable you've been assigning. Um, so I I reviewed a bit of those pieces here, uh, and then. He'd pointed out some other corner cases. Um, but anyway, uh, what I wanted to get to was, you know, if we've got this, how do we actually test it? We didn't actually have either runtime or compile time tests for, for this stuff. Uh, we had, you know, actual instances of, of things reading past the ends of buffers in the kernel. Um, but we didn't have good, uh, we didn't have really, uh, we didn't have a, uh, actually formalized runtime tests. Uh, so um, in another series, I'll go back, get the link for that as well. Mm -hmm. So this was another series uh, a while back from uh, Daniel Axtons that added uh, tests and a couple other things. Let me go to that real quick. Um, yep, so he'd added looking at actual runtime tests to say, hey, we should freak out and blow up uh, if, we're, if we're actually you know, make sure that this actually triggers. Um, um, so he he'd examined those. Uh, the coverage was mostly for testing a difference that uh, he was adding uh, that was part of, there's long history in the fortified bits, but it was a, a test. He was switching, uh, that is being tested here is a difference between um, inter-object and intra-object sizes, which I'd hinted at earlier in looking at, um, let's look at 
let's try and double copy. It's a little bit more involved. Oh, sorry. This is. Uh, let me go look at the unmodified version first. Okay, so this is as the kernel stands right now. This built-in object size zero argument actually says, tell me the size of the surrounding object. Um, and if you have sort of a freestanding, um, you know, you're in a function and you just say, you know, character buff, uh, you know, 32. Um, if you do a built-in object size, I pasted wrong. <sighs> buff 32. If you do a built-in object size of buff zero, this is gonna be 32, and one is gonna be 32, uh, because the containing object is itself, like it does not have a container in the sense of the, the structure. But if you have, a buff. Two. B. Uh, this will be kind of exciting. So, first one says, "Tell me the size of the containing object." Um, let me uh, let me make this a little easier. So this is 32, 8, and 8, so this is going to be 40. Because it says, let me look at, sorry, let's say our instance. So it says, look at instance of buff and tell me the size of the containing object. And the containing object is, you know, all 40 bytes. We've got our eight here, eight here, and the 32 in the buffer. Uh, but if we say, just look at the, 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 the size of this specific member of the object, then we get 32. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for this distinction, uh, but one of the more uh, awkward problems is that in a lot of places, the kernel, especially for memcopy, will do stuff like say, you know, I want a mem copy into you know, some some uh, destination from you know some destination member field from some uh, source of bytes and we have some big number. Uh, and it's actually expecting to overwrite multiple field numbers at a time. And this is an unfortunately common thing. So we can't bound like the fortify check, especially for memcopy, on looking at just the size of the destination member that's being targeted. Uh, because in a lot of places, we're walking well past it. Um, so as the first step to adding the fortify uh, coverage, you know, several years back, um, started with sort of the, the, the weakest form of this, which is to look at the object size, not the specific member size. Now, it is uh, virtually non-existent. I have not seen any in quite some time uh, in, the, in the string copy case. We don't actually find places in the kernel that say, I want to write to a specific string and then blow past the end of it. Um, I think I found one instance of this back when doing the user copy hardening, and that got fixed at that time. So I'm not aware of any more of these. So for the string copy case, we want to, we actually want to switch to the, the comma one version of built-in object size. Uh, so that's, uh, that's another piece of what uh, Daniel's series was turning on. Uh, and I can go show that. Let me clean all this up. So that was the one here, was describing this case of if we're trying to write to A right now, we will blow past the end of A and, and write into B, um, even with Fortify enabled, uh, unless we switch on switch from 0 to 1. So this basically goes through and switches all the 
all the object size tests from 0 to 1 for the string um, helpers. We can't do this for memcopy yet. We'll do this sort of one step at a time. Otherwise, we get so many false positives that uh, people get angry and we disrupt everybody. Um, and then that's what this test is checking. It's basically saying, uh, you know, let's say we have two neighboring uh, instances of, of some object. Um, we should catch the Ob, you know, in object to object overflow, uh, and then the other one should we should be able to catch uh, f from one member of the single object into the next, uh, and you can you can see the um, you know we've got dynamic sizes here, so we can't tell what the um, what's going on. You know, the compiler isn't going to be able to figure this out right away. Uh, we can add hinting to the kmalloc, but it doesn't really work because even if you came out like say 20 that might not be the right bucket size um, like the bucket size for the came out might actually be larger so anyway um, but i wanted to go through and just um, demonstrate this piece of the of the changes uh, i can Or if I, uh, I think I want to change this, I'm going to rename this since this is sort of uh, stuff I was working on. Work in progress. Then we can check out into something else, maybe call it. Um, Start with I think Daniel's tree. So this is the uh, intra object. And uh, I will remove the oops. Right. I just made some changes. Uh, I just made some changes a while back, but it doesn't matter. I want to get rid of my SKP test because it was not or uh, coverage because it wasn't wasn't quite right. And we can copy. I don't know. My sit comp config is pretty good. From just make sure Fortify is enabled. Yes. Okay. So let's get this built. Can talk about some other pieces. Um, so this just uh, I just want to illustrate the the inter object and in, inter and intra object testing. Um, now another piece that was on my topic list for today. Um, was looking at this under Clang because it was discovered since, again, we do not have runtime and compile time tests in the kernel right now. Um, it turns out Clang 10 and later or something changed how it's optimizer. What was the, what was my uh, uh, carbonated water container opening? <laughs> um, Clang 10 and I think Clang 10 and later or something along those lines, uh, something changed in the optimizer or how it was doing its fortified checks and uh, it thinks it can optimize the way the entire the kernel entire um, kernel's entire fortify implementation, uh, which is no good. So we're Back, this is done. I can shut this down. And work on Fortify. Yes, yes. Zoom. Do do. 
Okay, so let's look at what we have available in debug uh, LKDTM. Um, so we should have now these two new tests, fortify object and fortify sub object. Um, saw the executable stack message. Yes. <laughs> As it, oops, uh, as it shot by, yes, this, this line was really bugging me after I got Docker set up inside my VM for doing suck comp, uh, bitmap, constant action bitmap speed performance testing. That was really bugging me. Um, I suspect that it was harmless, but uh, it, it masks any other executable stack warnings because the kernel has this set as a warn once. Um, so you see only the first thing that ever gets seen with an executable stack. Um, Horizon, actually they're all, they're all Intel. <laughs> um, it's all Xeon. Um, I need to get, I need to get Gustavo to stream his, his builds. He's got twice as many cores. Um, yeah, this, so this would mask any other executable stack uh, issues like something I actually you know was in a, a long-lived process or a, you know a daemon or something uh, so I definitely want to get that fixed up but I I dug that out because it was there's not a lot of clues to figure out where in the world this was um, I found like reference to QMU check and it's basically docker looking at bin format misc basically figuring out what kinds of containers it can run possibly through emulation to sort of auto detect whether or not it can execute various binaries. Uh, but all those binaries were really, really simple, you know, exit zero effectively. Um, so they're all written in, in short assembly, uh, but, the, but the default on a, lot of, um, on a lot of linkers, or sorry, I should say assemblers, is to just leave the stack executable if nothing was showing as marking it one way or the other. Um, so I just overrode Docker's build of those things and regenerated them, but yeah. Um, here are our fortify objects. So let's, uh, so this one should get detected. We'd expect, I'm doing this silly redirection so that if my thread gets killed, uh, the cat program gets killed instead of my shell. For example, if I did this as echo into here, um, if my thread gets killed, the echo is actually being run by the shell, and the shell has that file descriptor open. Uh, and so if the kernel thread gets killed, my shell gets killed, and I get logged out. Whereas in this form, uh, cat is dealing with both of the file descriptors, and cat will get killed, like that. So let's take a look at the result here, and we sort of get what we expected. So performing fortify object, trying to read past the end of a struct. You know, boom, detected buffer, uh, buffer overflow non copy. And if you look at, bring this back up. So we've got, yeah, we've got this num copy into the target. And we went past it because we set our size to 11 and we made sure the compiler couldn't see it by marking it as volatile. Um, or rather, made, made it so it could not reason about it at compile time. Um, this writes past the end and boom, it did in fact blow up the way we wanted to. Yay! Now we would expect this one currently to. Oh, it does. It does detect it. Why? I wonder. Let's see. Um, oh, right. It does detect it because we're using Daniel's series, which turns on the checking. So it says detected buffer overflow and string copy. Um, and that was patch one, is turning, turning these uh, object tests on for the, the different pieces. So if instead we uh, reverted that patch, but left the tests. D 
do 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 do. And since they're all inline, we have to basically recompile everything that touches it. <clears throat> so in this case, what we should see is sort of the current state of the kernel, uh, which will not detect those uh, cross buffer copies or cross member, I should say. That should be done in a moment. Okay. A little bit faster this time. The things we didn't have to recompile, we didn't recompile. I think you make it's the linking stage I'd like to see faster. Do do do. Almost there. Done. Boot. All right. So again, object still trips. I would expect sub object not to trip. All right. And so yike. And it says, you know, yikes. I did not freak out. Uh, this is bad. Now, um, I'm going to swap to uh, doing this with <coughs> the LLVM. Uh, so we'll get Clang building this. Now, if nothing's changed from before, <coughs> um, Clang won't even detect the object copy, uh, which is pretty bad. And it basically just throws away the entire um, I'll go back to the code again. Clang effectively just sees string copy and carries on and it sort of uh, throws away the implementation and says, oh I know I know what string copy or string cat or string copy all these things are. I know what those are. I don't need to look at this. Um, it seems as though to trigger the protections we have to call or rename these to being uh, check functions, which is sort of how the internals of Fortify work in, in how uh, the compiler and, for example, glibc communicate to each other about the fact that they're doing a runtime check. So instead of um, you know, like the built-in string cat, we do a string cat check uh, in the case of not being able to do a runtime test. Um, so that'll require rewriting a bit here, and I would like to explore that a bit, um, but we'll see what we get to. Um, all right, hopefully this is built correctly. Let's shut down. Almost done. Ooh, checking my virtual disk. I reboot so often. And I just want to double check that we're not testing the wrong thing. Yes, okay, built with Clang and LLD. And if I've got a problem, this is gonna break. Yep, it did not catch it. So um, negative 222, well, that's weird. Uh, and that's that's sort of the root of the problem with that is Clang and Fortify, the kernels Fortify, I should say, do not play nice together. And we've got it enabled. Um, so let's go look at the uh, LKDTM tests. I look in the bugs. So the issue here is test on Fortify here is using memcopy to do that, that test. So let's look at see looking at a 
Special names are bad for the kernel, good for user programs. Right, yes. So, yeah, the, the compiler is really mostly expecting to build user space stuff. Building the kernel is constantly painful. Um, the kernel loves doing things in its own special way and having its own implementations, and it's not its own, you know, it's sort of its own libc, but not really. So it's mostly a standalone. Um, it's kind of a standalone tool, but yeah, the, the various optimizations the compiler tries to do uh, are kind of strange. Uh, there's a actually a recent one. Let me see if it shows up in here. Uh, lib strp copy? No, st, stp copy? Yes. So this is one I didn't even know existed somewhere in libc, um, but stp copy is like string copy, but it returns um, it returns the pointer to the null terminating character in the destination. So you can sort of like chain these together. Uh, you can chain calls together. And Clang at some point decided it could do some optimizations where it could convert certain kinds of code into just calling STP copy. Um, but of course, kernel didn't implement STP copy. Uh, so things started blowing up. Um, so the sort of middle ground we took here was because this is yet another completely un, like there's no testing being done here on buffer sizes, anything. There's no size limits or anything. It's just, it's, it's string copy, but with a different return value. Um, the answer was we do not and put this in an include, uh, but it is exported so that it can be linked against. Um, that's just dealing with yet another weird stringism uh, that is kind of no fun. Um, all right, so if we go back and look at Linux string.h, let's go look at our mem copy implementation. Okay, so I'm going to go divert um oh question from chat is linux kernel compiled with clang i always thought it was used gcc uh traditionally everyone used gcc uh for the past several years there's been a concerted effort to make sure it compiles correctly uh with clang and that it just works now um i recommend at least clang 10 uh, i tend to use pretty like uh usually close to the tip of tree on Clang. But yeah, it works. Uh, the LLVM equals one is a shorthand for saying basically use all LLVM tools, use the LLVM linker, use the, um, you know, the, the AR tool and the assembler, everything else. Uh, but uh, yeah, most most people, the default is use just whatever's on, on, on your system and that's gonna be GCC in almost all cases. But yeah, it builds and runs fine with Clang. Um, I mean, except for lots of weird little bugs. Sure, you're welcome. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go back through the issues and find the Clang issue again that I already pasted. Hold on. Fortify. So it's kind of interesting. I like using this um, this tool, this godbolt.org, which is handy for um, looking at the sort of the compilation results of uh, between two between uh, two compilers. And that link there is uh, running on a server, just beefy machine. Um, the build server is is just a really beefy machine. Um, it's a workstation. I've got some notes in the in the, in the Twitch about screen. Um, right. So if you look at if you go and look at I'm not set up to really show my browser, but um, if you go look at that Godbolt URL, you can see sort of the output of uh, 
clang on the top where it just calls memcopy. Off it goes. Um, as opposed to in GCC, it actually does the evaluation, figures out, oh wait, there is a potential that I need to, you know, freak out and break. Um, and the, the issue appears to be lacking. Hold on, there was this commit from George, sort of attempting to solve this. Let me go find his map. Oops. Scrolled my chat window instead. Memcopy. All right, so his thought was for memcopy, we should drop. Let me go look. Um, instead of calling underlying memcopy, we could do built in memcopy check and include the P size. So instead of this, we would have to do return built in memcopy check P, Q, size, and P size. And we can drop the runtime check for. P size here, since the 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 expected built-in memcopy check that GCC and Clang both implement in the face of uh, make sure I've got all right underscores. Yes, I do. Um, doesn't actually check for the the source buffer getting read beyond the end of. Uh, it only checks the destination. Uh, but then, of course, we actually have to implement uh, this because without that, um, let's see, arch admin move. Put it in the middle. Hold on, let me make sure this is the right file. No, that's a move string. Okay. in the middle here. Okay. Okay, I'm copying out George's version of this. Alright, built in mem copy. Which I think we need to make underlying just for some other things, but let's just look at this for the moment. So this is mem copy check. So this won't be this won't be great because we can't inline this. Um, so this would be a callout, which is not going to be performant. So we do have to modify it, but I mostly want to do this to verify um, that things actually get caught again. Uh, so let's let's just see if this works. If I blindly do it, why hello uh, from chat. Count the test size. Paste it wrong. Oh, yeah, that's uh hold on. The unlikely is wrapped in the wrong place actually. That would be just a zero or one, which is not good. Okay. Um, so like I said, this is uh, mostly just uh, testing to make sure that the Clang's detection works again if we rearrange it to use the, to call it to memcopy check. I'm hoping that I can still inline these things, etc. So that's the whole, kind of the whole point. 
was so worrying to buy, but we'll get it at the end. Oh, and one other thing I wanted to look at was what is the minus 22 part? M copy minus 222 result is int. Oh, that's not, that's mem compare, not mem copy. I am misreading. Yeah, it is fun to touch everything. Anyway, sorry, that's mem. Two, yeah, it's angry about. Oh, right, so it has actually started to detect things. <laughs> so these are what the Clang's compile time versions end up looking like because you can't do, because of how Clang's inliner and optimizer work, you can't really. Uh, you can't get the actual warning, compile time warning at um, like compilation unit time. You can only get it at link time. Uh, because you basically have to create a symbol that can't be linked against to get it to stop. Okay, so it's basically telling me there are some places that it sees um, memcopy now failing, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, we'll go take a look at that, but, but the next thing I want to actually look at is uh, quickly fixing up. I thought this was mem compare. I missed this. This should be mem copy. So what I want to do is go from one into, well, still a mem copy, but still. Uh, let's make this, let's do what we did here. Do, do, do. Okay, so source is our key malloc. And I think what we just want to do is case okay, string dupe over 10 bytes. both reading past the end and writing past the end now. I go from source and size. Okay. Um, let me come back. Let's come back with that again. We're going to need to go look at the other warnings too. It's kind of fun. I wasn't expecting Clang to find any new instances of this, but Clang's inliner is very different. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. I'm copy returns void pointer. We actually don't care about the result. wants uh, something. Let's just do this. Maybe we won't elide the entire test now.
this one shouldn't be too bad since we're just mucking with LK DDM. Countdown timer. Um, I just have a horrible little thing that um, I got sick of <clears throat> not knowing how long something was going to take, even though it knew how long it took to build last time. Um, so I just added a little thing that every time the build succeeds, it records how long it took. And I made myself a little terminal timer that counts down um, uh, that's running in the background, um, just so I have an idea. It's not particularly accurate. Uh, it's only useful when I'm doing the same thing over and over and over. OK, so we got two two warnings, ironically, out of um, out of LKDTM itself, uh, because it loves to do horrible, horrible things to the kernel, which is its, in, its intended purpose. I'm trying to figure out where it will. It's not really give me a good. Um, it just tells me what function. It doesn't get me any closer than that. Which is to. I don't know who the case cook is. I'm just one of them. Um, right, kernel. <laughs> no. uh, so this is basically saying, hey, look, I know we've got this unsigned character pointer somewhere. Please don't, um, please don't write right past the end. I've got a size. Um, I can it can likely figure out this size since they're just the distance between functions. Um, we're writing into an arbitrary pointer, but I tried to make this invisible GCC. This is invisible GCC, but apparently Clang is smarter about this. Um, well, we're just going to pretend for the moment to make that go away. This should be pretty fast. Off we go. Still blowing up. Okay, what do we care? Oh, right, we had additional ones in real mode set up. Um, makes it really difficult to get these compilation warnings out, but at least it stops the build, which was sort of the, the point. Uh, so this we got to track down with the mem copy. And we've got a base. And our base is a pointer, right? So basically, it's trying to say, hey, you're overwriting, you know, you have a pointer to a single character. You can't have this size be anything more than a one. Uh, but what we're trying to say is, no, no, we're a, we're a character, you know, we're a, uh, we're a character array of unknown size. May just also be looking at real mode header. So oh, where can we find? Yeah, that's a structure. So right now I'm just again I'm just gonna cheat because I want to solve this just for my build. We can come back to it. <laughs> what happened to my Glamorous hair, <laughs> which I, sh I shaved it off. It's the pandemic haircut. Uh, to do a full all mod config on this machine is about five minutes. comment from chat is I look like Walter White. That's true. I need a hat and um, all sorts of terrible things happen to me. <laughs> I think I'll just stay being me. Um, okay. Built now. Let's see if I've done horrible things. Whoops. Sorry. That's not what I wanted. Ah. 
Ah, ah, type. All right, let's see. Okay, we at least still boot, so nothing truly horrendous has happened. <laughs> still undetected. Interesting, interesting. Of course, the question is, um, would that be caught by GCC now since I changed the test? So let's try uh, doing this build without LVM. Make sure I have a valid test since I did change it. We don't want to do mem compare. We want to do mem copy. Anyway, the, the instance of the, the real mode boot is interesting. I need to go take a look at that because I, I suspect there's also uh, structure size something there must be something different about how gcc and clang deal with having a a typecast on on the on the destination and source i think it's likely that clang doesn't believe the typecast but i guess i'll find out I haven't even gotten to trying to do compile time testing. Um, I can show that in a second. The runtime testing is relatively straightforward. Okay, you're done. You're done. Okay, let's boot again. Happy. We're done booting. We're done booting. Let's do object, not detected. So I wrote a bad test. Let's try this again. Do, 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 do. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Yeah, that's over ten bytes. Um, target is okay. Size, we don't know. Hmm. Don't think that should matter. But let's see. I'm probably going to end up having to look at the disassembly. At least we can shut down and start over. It doesn't seem like it would work. Hmm. Or rather, I would have expected GCC to catch that already. I wonder if it's being, um, I wonder if it's looking at the object of the entire array that that structure is in. Uh, let's see. If this does not trip again, then I'll change that. Trip? Nope. Not trip. So I think the issue might be the fact that it's looking at target, and target has two of these, so there's still plenty of sizing to... Uh, it's not overwriting this one, so we'll just say um, do, do, do. wrap this in some buffers. We will uh, do stupid things to copy them around. Um, oh no, I can keep. Keep these just by using their addresses a couple times. One, but two. Maybe, let's see if that works. Favorite things from Linux kernel at the moment. 
Um, still building my list. But let's go look. There's a bunch of interesting highlights from recent recent releases. my fingers and then we're going to start going to look at disassembly but I'd prefer not to. Eh? Good. Okay. So that was the problem. It was looking at the, the whole outer object. And now we get a proper detected buffer overflow and then copy check. So GCC is calling down into it happily. Um, that's good. Okay, so I just wrote a bad test, and let's try build this with Clang and see if it retains the checks for now. Yeah, so it looks like it decided that it was going to look at the whole larger object, including the full array, and that the array had two members, so there was clearly plenty of room after the destination for an overflow. Anyway, this is sort of my point about doing the, the runtime testing is we have to construct a whole series of different tests um, to catch every single corner case. Did we overwrite the end? Did we overread the end of the source um, for each one of those? And the runtime tests are the ones that, um, you know, we'd prefer the, these be in compile time tests as well. So that's the other half, and we'll get to that. Sorry, I'm just catching up on chat. Linus owns a chain of fast food restaurants. Yes. <laughs> okay. Almost done with that link. Did I shut down? I did. Okay. Still booting. Hmm. One moment. I don't need that for my testing. And it paused there, so I don't want that. I'll put in my git diff. Sure, uh, one second. I've kind of mangled the, the test as it was, but here, let's go look at where we are now. Um, so I'm papering over this warning. Um, I need to go look at how base and real mode blob are configured because it sounds like LVM is seen through the casting. Um, I guess it was saying both, it was over reading and over writing. So I think these pointers are going to be confused. Uh, and then in the original test, we were, I had misread it. Um, the original test was here was mem compare. It was strictly doing an overread of the source uh, because it was seeing, you know, this is the second element of this array. And if the size, um, it was basically seeing that it was walking past the end when reading the source. But when I switched it to mem copy, uh, the, the target was, I probably could have moved the target to the second one, but the target was the first of the two instances here, which meant it felt it could continue writing and stay within the object, the target object. Uh, so I had to remove that and then to make it safe so that if we successfully stomp over it, um, I added bytes on either side that in theory should stay in that orientation um, and then included them in in the output here so they wouldn't get optimized away from existing. Um, this is pretty hacky, but yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, so, okay, here we are, we're booted. 
Um, let's get this one. Yay! Okay, so Clang detects it. What do we see? Um, all right, we get the same thing. Basically, we're freaking out in the middle of of uh, memcopy now, which is what we wanted for a runtime check. So um, that's sort of the basic parameters for um, fixing this, although I'd really, really love to avoid this being a, a call out, uh, like this is an actual call instead of inline. So I want to try, um, does Linux work with Clang? Yep, no, no, it, uh, it builds and boots fine. It's been doing so for a couple of years. I recommend Clang 10 or 11 or later. But I mean, all of the, like for example, all the uh, Android phones, all those kernels are built with Clang. Um, Pixel for several years is built with Clang. But x86 builds and boots fine. Um, there's always tiny gotchas once in a while in corner cases, but a lot of that's under most of the work that's being done for LTO and CFI that's not upstream yet. But yes, Clang is, is happy with the kernel now. Um, in fact, I think, where is it? Process requirements? No. I'll go off. Clang. Dev tools? No. I mean, there's a bunch of LVM thing changes. Maybe that's it. Yes. AI documentation process. I don't know why it's in changes. So this is sort of the, I don't know why it's called changes, but current minimal requirements for a bunch of things. Uh, so uh, you want GCC 4.9 or later, and Clang now is 10.01 and later. Um, uh, out of chat. Uh, I, I'm not putting on music because you get exciting things with Twitch or YouTube, like muting the entire stream. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay, so we've booted, or we're testing, that works. Oh, right, I wanted to move, I want to move this out of here and see if I can make it inline and have it still work correctly, because that's not, uh, having this be a called function is not okay. I'll make things very slow, and that's actually how this problem was discovered to begin with. So let's go look at where we have our fortify specified, not defined, no fortified, and we've got optimize, and we've got fortify source, turn on these things. Let's put it here, and let's see if this magically works copy on this should be called all right I'm gonna leave this built-in mem copy for the moment I think that doesn't matter but uh, I might need to change it because of how we interact with ksan and ksan would also like to overload some of these uh, so it gets a little awkward um, but I believe these should just be called underlying underlying uh, I'll change it now. okay Let's see what happens when we build. LLVM has a libc now. Um, no, I don't. I don't think so. I don't understand. I don't understand the question about building using LLVM's libc. Like the kernel doesn't actually use libc. It implements its own internals for what it needs. Real cores, half of them are real cores. It's hyper threaded, but yeah. Hmm. They have their own libc. Fascinating. Oh, Calebc. Hmm. Calebc for a very long time, speaking, talking back to <coughs> the earlier topic of executable stacks, uh, Calebc was having a problem with executable stacks for some time. I'm seeing a lot of weird stuff go by in this build. But what am I seeing? Change section attributes. All right, well, 
I expect that to show up in my standard error output. Is it not? Let's see. So I have my my little build wrapper basically keeps a copy of standard error and then shows all of standard error to me at once. Oh yeah, it did. I just happened to see the one. Um, I thought I saw more than just that one morning though. I'll have to go check that later. Um, okay, we built. This is inline. Oops, I didn't shut down. Sorry, you have to wait. Not for very long. Well, it still boots. <laughs> It's like my low bar. Does it still boot? Ah, it's working. <laughs> Yay. Okay, good. So uh, this means I don't have to make these callouts. They can just be defined and they can be inline and it'll still catch it. Um, it's not the greatest error message. Um, I'd like to see something... Um, something a little bit better. I mean, it, it shows it in the, it shows in the call trace, so it's not a big deal, but it would be nice if the you know, detected buffer overflow and mem copy check. Like, well, how about detected buffer overflow in, mm, you know, okay, DTM fortify object is really where this happened. But I think we can improve on that uh, since we say, Fortify, panic, should be declared somewhere around here. Isn't this the first one? Yeah. And, uh, okay, so we do underscore underscore function here. Hmm. We might be able to improve that. Uh, we could pass, for example, oh no, that would break the, I was gonna say we could pass the, um, the name of it down into one copy check, but of course that would break Clang's recognition of the check. <laughs> NASA has a much larger mainframe, um, I imagine. Okay, so this should solve the Clang piece of it, which is nice. But now, so that's runtime, we've got runtime testing, so we'll have coverage uh, on both GCC and Clang for doing runtime pieces, and we can add the tests for LGATTM. Uh, but very noticeably, uh, so for example, let's come back to this. That's right, we just tested this piece, um, the destination overwrite, um, but, oops, uh, let's check, where's our other one? This one is also, um, this is checking the read side of it. This was checking the write side of it. Um, I wonder if I can change this to underlying, but anyway. Um, but the piece that we can't test at runtime is actually this portion, right? The, because this is evaluated at compile time. So we want to be able to test, did we write this correctly, right? We need to check the bounds, the boundary conditions uh, on this and actually determine the corner cases of that one. Um, but of course, if we write code that this thing would, dete would detect, um, it will fail to compile, which means we can't just add a rule uh, to it. Um, and since uh, I'd like to look at this, I'm just going to start that up and go look at, uh, go back to this for another, another window. What if I, so I'm basically rebuilding with GCC now and I don't want to waste, waste your time with it. So uh, I'll come back to this and look at, Okay, so we, we want to be able to test this, but if we, if we, a, a successful test is a failed build of something calling memcopy uh, in a potentially dangerous way. Um, you know, that would look like, I don't know, uh, bad. So really obvious stuff we ought to be able to catch would be uh, character buff C. 
six and M copy into buff. Oh no, this is big. Or bad. Or that's too big. Makes sense. Um, I wonder if it'll detect it if I make this a pointer, but let's just go like this. Right, these are all of this now is extremely. Um, let's see, hold on, I'll come back to chat in a second. So this this is all extremely extremely easy for the compiler to see now. We've got a fixed size buffer destination. Uh, let's call it. Uh, let's call this destination just for fun. All right, we've got a fixed size destination. We've got a known compiler assigned size source. We're using size of source. Literally everything here is the built-in constants. This should spectacularly fail if the compile time testing is checking anything. Um, so uh, yeah, let's will this even can I even get this in there at all. Let's just try. Let's look at CFI real quick. What else do I need to include? Mm -hmm. And just for good measure, always include your SPDX license. Nothing is actually calling it, but that doesn't matter. So, in theory, ooh, exciting. GCC does not like this. What did I do? Let me check. GCC doesn't like it if it's inlined. Fascinating. Hold on. Seven built in mem copy check, but we do have mem copy check. I mean, it's right there, <laughs> huh? And check that for GCC. What, um, hmm. but only in two instances. Only for only for a couple instances. Why does it think there's an undefined reference? Hmm. I don't think anything's left over. Okay, I'm gonna check up on it clean, but let me do restart the build just in case there's something freaky left over, uh, and I'll catch up on chat here. I bet I'm just gonna get the same error. But anyway, okay. So looking into chat, um, C++ compiler for C project. Yeah. So C lang is C++ and C. Um, yeah. So LLVM is basically a giant. Uh, tool, uh, like a, a whole tool chain. Um, so it's got front ends in the sense that it's something it can compile f out of a language, whether that language is Rust or C or C++ or Objective-C. Um, and that's got an intermediate representation. Uh, that's the LLVM IR. And then on the back end is turning that IR into machine code. So that's the back ends of LLVM. One nice thing about um, about LLVM is that all the backends, you basically pick them all at, at build time. So you get one package that can do cross compilation to everything you compiled for a backend. Like the way GCC is designed, you have to sort of install every single cross compiler. Um, that's a little bit easier. Um, 
improve Unicode handling or move to Rust. Eh, there's people that have been looking at Rust in the compiler. Okay, so this is still GCC. Oh, okay, yeah, so it, you know, it got further, so I'm going to assume that there was some problem in me switching between LVM and, I'm sorry, switching between Clang and GCC, and I'm going to pretend that didn't happen. Um, and instead, here is the example of exactly what we want to see from a compile test, right? This is LKDTM's bad. It blew up because we're going to have a write overflow at that location. Please don't do that. Line three, right? No, that's file included. Uh, line 10. All right, so this is line 10. Yes, please don't do this, then copy, right? Perfect. We are, in fact, uh, testing it happily. But of course, the kernel stopped building <laughs> because the compilation failed. Um, so this has been sort of a thought experiment of mine is how do we deal with this? Um, there's a lot of tests that exist already for um, for these kinds of compilation failures. Like I wrote a whole bunch uh, back when I was working uh, at Canonical on Ubuntu. Uh, let me go find source URL. It's in the it's in the topics for today. But um, like here's this collection of sort of really simplistic tests for, you know, various Fortify features. Uh, this was wider than, than just string copy. Like this is looking at extra arguments, missing modes on like on open and stuff. Um, let's see if I can find. Anyway, but the point was that each of these um, ah, some more have been added, not just me. Um, each of these is intended to either throw a warning or fail in some fashion. Um, and then that failure gets detected. And what do we, like what I had in Ubuntu's uh, QA regression testing was um, this giant test runner Python script that would basically has all the expectations built into it, and it would try to run the make and look for specific warnings. Um, and it, uh, it's it's good for that design, but I'm trying to do this in the kernel as part of the kernel's build infrastructure. So <clears throat> I really would prefer to avoid writing a whole separate like Python wrapper. <clears throat> and I'd really like it to be part of the kernel build. All right, I don't want this to be a separate test somewhere. And the, the reason I'd like to be part of the, the main <clears throat> kernel build is because the options that are being passed, right, if you do here, like if I say touch this and then uh, let's build with verbose. Um, I'm gonna catch up on chat again. All right, there's some things happening on Rust. Okay, so if we look at this, you know, this is what we're this is what we want to get out of it. We want to say, yes, we failed to build this thing. That's nice. We want that warning. Um, but if you look at how this was built, all right? There's all the arguments that came out of the build scripts, you know, there's various defines added, various warnings and other types and different modes that we're, we're building under. Um, and we, we don't want to have to reconstruct this to have a separate test somewhere else. Um, it, it would be preferable that this whole thing happened sort of internally to the kernel. Um, yes, yeah, just to confirm on chat. Yeah, Linus is doing his kernel builds with Clang too. Um, I mean, not all of them. He does builds with Clang in addition to GCC. He was, uh, Clang just added a speed up in how it handles this asm go to with outputs. Uh, now you can have an output on the default path. 
Um, that speeds up some of the, or simplifies, I should say, uh, the coding of the get user and put user pieces. And that just went in, I think that landed for 5.10. Um, but he's been working on that because it's a Clang specific uh, feature. Um, anyway, so I was thinking about, if you look at, let's see if I can look for CC option. Um, you see this a lot is calling out to some of these make file, uh, the kbuild helpers like CC option to determine if some feature exists. And that'll actually do, um, so build half the kernel of the client and half the GCC. So in theory, that should work. Uh, let's not. <laughs> but I mean, uh, to, to track down compiler bugs, uh, we've done that, right? We can't figure out why some boot is going sideways, uh, various debugging, attempts to debug it, disrupt whatever the bug is. So you build the entire kernel and all of its objects files, you know, with, with say GCC, and then you suspect the area where Clang might be doing something wrong, for example, if you think it's a Clang bug, um, and you just start replacing the object files and then doing a link until you can narrow the object file down. <laughs> and then you start splitting up a compilation unit into into function, you know, per function to narrow stuff down. It gets, gets crazy, but yes, you can boot with a half and half build. Um, so I've been, been pondering how CC option is implemented and I've been pondering how the tests for, um, uh, let's see, how the tests for stack protector work, which is you just basically sort of run, um, this is taking a dollar star and adding some additional things to force specific modes. Um, but that dollar star has a stack protector. If you look at how this is being done, um, it's using, oops, it has it's using the CC out of here. Um, this, however, is in kconfig. It used to be in the make file. I'm not sure that's as good. Um, but if we look at where kbuild happens, I think we can say CC option. Is that how we define it? Yeah, okay. So if you look at kbuilds include, which is um, make file include, we see down here we've got it's calling CC with kbuild CPP flags, kbuild C flags. Um, something down at this level is basically where we want to be for doing one of these tests, but we want to we want to have it a success should be at failing. <laughs> um, and getting the rules to work correctly, I'm not I'm not really sure the best approach to take with this because at the same time, like I don't want to have to um, if these were a phony target, it would mean that the, the build would always run those tests on every build, even if we successfully tested it on the last build without changing anything, without changing any dependencies. Um, so it would be nice if this could actually detect things and then we trick it out somehow. Like, I'm not sure if, let's see, uh, Drivers misc lkdtm make file. So if we had something like, um, all right. So the way that things work right now, and lkdtm already does a number of goofy things. You can see the object copy happening, but uh, object y is how um, how kbuild is going to choose its targets. Um, so when you say you know, config lkdtm. If you've actually built that in, you get config, you know, object y or object m. But if we have to object y, and we say plus equals, I don't know, something, and we have our target be something that o depends on some, you know, some phony target. If we if we just had a phony target, it wouldn't work. Um, marketing 
any aspects yet to be handled. Hmm, I'm not following. I'd have to read chat here again. Do, 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 do. So we're going to address architecture into aliased flow points that are allocated fractionally into the binary assembler. I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, that will require more brain power than I've got at the moment. Um, anyway, so if, sorry, to go back to the uh, phony, 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 I don't know how to spell phony. Um, if I did something like this, it would always try to build something, right? Um, even if it had already gotten built. Uh, it would sort of ignore whether or not it exists. So I don't want to do that because that'll just waste everyone's time. Um, but I do want to actually have finished the build. So if like the dependency of something that O is bad.c and I do cc k build cpp flags uh, k builds uh, c flags dash o bad dot o bad dot c um, so like, I want that command line to fail. Uh, and if it fails, then something that O should be created successfully. Like we, I would like there to be something that gets spit out, but then gets, um, I don't know, effectively ignored. Like it, it shouldn't be part of the kernel at the end, uh, but we do want the make file targets to work. Um, so I was pondering, like, can I just do some kind of empty, uh, like, can I just copy? Uh, so I'll do an or to say it should fail, or um, copy, I don't know, discard something. Uh oh, this, this is like just total hacky thinking out loud. Um, I have no idea if that would work, but. Uh, Let's see, because the targets, here's where I add targets. And I don't, yeah, it's a very, very strange way to go about doing this. So uh, if anyone has any ideas, I don't know. But let's just try this. Um, see what that looks like. Probably I could do, Targets, targets, I think is, oops, that's better than object Y here. So, object bad.c, don't want to do the object copy. Um, and we want to copy this to wherever the actual output is. Um, hmm. Yeah, so uh, in theory, you should be able to cross compile. Some things get, you know, bothered, but um, anyway, okay. Uh, So this is going to fail because I don't have discard.o, but I just want to see what it thinks of my ridiculous attempt to get this. The problem is these tests need to be included with other things. Um, oh, sorry, I probably actually left, I left bad in here as an actual target. They're expected to fail because it cannot copy my um, my fake thing. But it should only do that if it actually fails. And it didn't even do anything. Mm -hmm. data. I have arrow data object copy. Uh oh, 
I don't remember why targets is there. Let's find out what happens if I swap it around. Um, the idea I'd have is that this could be not tied to LKDTM per se. It might make sense to leave it there. So perfect, right? Um, this blew up, got mad about it, but kept on going. Um, and then got even more mad about it and then failed. <laughs> Why is my exit code zero though? Mm -hmm. No targets make bad C. Does it not have? Let's look at cable include. Source tree, ah, source tree, oh, that's top level. Uh, source tree. I'm trying to figure out what the, I've forgotten what the shorthand is for source. It looks like just source, okay. from, I don't know, we'll assume that I have some sort of discard from before. Um, make a dependency as well, discard it out, and we'll say, uh, nothing to see here. To keep it around, but let's find out again. I should get away with not doing my sinks. Oh, I just have something terribly wrong. That's all. Thinking is I could actually create a an empty function that's uh, part of the discard section. Um, that way we could keep it. I have to rename it if I'm going to use it multiple times. What am I doing wrong? Expected error, but in oh, in bad dot c. I misread. So this is my concern is that this, I think the mil, the make file rule, this one is probably not going to cut it. Uh, oh, it's supposed to be, let's see what I see in it. Let's go look at scripts. Um, grep CPP flags. find out. Okay. Ah. Filter out. Yes, yeah, so there's all these very carefully constructed things in the builder that I'd really like to be able to use correctly. Okay, underscore C flags. Underscore C flags. 
Oh yeah, now we, have, now we get to see flags. See flags. Build, 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 build. Check, check, C flags, CPP, C flags. CCOC, that's the one we want. Type that build is command CCCO. No? This appears to be the one we want. Let's just uh, steal it for now. Oops. because we want to be redirecting it. Okay, so hopefully we've got this right now. And then I've got my discard, which is somewhere else. Um, Discard.c is just doing nothing in particular. Oh, but I want to say we could do, hold on, section dot discard dot uh, lkdtm sure uh, that won't get up in, I don't think this will end up in the right section oh of course I can do something like um, there ta da okay Let's see what this does with it. Um, let's see. Out of chat. Uh, how do you test a code when developing for Linux kernel? To build it in the, build an image and boot it in the VM every time we need to test a small change. Uh, to a certain degree, yep. That's sort of like this is the build window. Uh, this is my VM window and logging into the VM. Uh, but there's unit tests that you can that are being built. Uh, you can search for Linux K unit. Um, there's sort of the self-tests, which are more or less collections of functional tests that you can run against a running kernel. Um, most people just sort of stay focused on the specific thing that they're changing. It's more difficult for doing like tree-wide security mitigation work because it's not uh, trivial to test all functionality of the entire kernel and all of its configs, as you might imagine. Um, Okay, let's see what it is angry about. Um, value computed is not used. We don't care about that, um, do we? All right, we want to do this. How about this? I'm getting closer. I think Rust coming to Linux would be fine. Uh, people are already working on it. Let's see. Okay, so what do we get? Deleting file discard.o. It's still angry with me. Let's turn on. Yeah, this is very, very hacky approach to get a negative test. But I want to see what it does. Whee! Uh, object tool, what? Right. I would expect that to just work, right? What if I get rid of, oh right, this is where I need targets, right? Um, the thing that I've got, discard.o is the weirdo thing I'm adding, and then 
right, so borrow data is here. Borrow data object copy is mentioned there, but it's in both places. So perhaps I need both of them, except I want discard and something. Let's see what happens. Again. <laughs> Compilations, it seems seems like a lot of waiting for the compilation. Well, yeah, that's why I try to do things separately. Um, and you're actually getting to watch me mess around with really, really stupid ideas here. It really does not like this. Why is it? Discard. Discard should work, right? Add something. Do I need to specify discard here? Hmm. So I don't need to do it here, though. That's the thing I don't get. Um, this built it. I don't think I need this here. Discard should just get automatically added. Targets are the thing I am building and the thing that uh, was built ahead of me. And there is something that, oh, this should match the same pattern I have here. I'm just doing a very different uh, approach. I'm not doing a call, I've actually got a separate rule. So I'm wondering if it does not like having a separate rule. If I have to make it be, um, I don't know, maybe I don't have to use it. Hold on, uh, something, flag, how about that? And now I don't need discard. Uh, I don't know if I need the targets. I'll do touch object something dot flag. Maybe I don't need anything then. Of course, I have to think about how this should get added to. Um, <coughs> uh, it'll get added to the clean target. But anyway, this is mostly just me trying to get a negative build. <laughs> that ran through. Did it actually do anything? Yes, yes. Let me remember about your mem copy issues. at all. There's my incredibly useful... Um, oh, right. Uh, Something.o is up here, but that's not going to work anymore. And I don't know where the tag... I don't know how targets will work there. Well, maybe I'll just have to play this more later. I was hoping there'd be a, a relatively easy way um, to add to the targets. I'm just gonna have to go read the docs more closely and how that should work. Uh, yeah, because it didn't, um, didn't appear to do anything, right? I need, yeah, the fast, compilation is a fast bit. I kind of agree. Something about flag, targets equals something about flag. Um, I feel like I need there needs to be some way to do this out of um, if I'm getting a second mic for the CPU fans. Uh -huh. That'd be funny. Um, 
Target, target. Okay, source, object, echo, right. Support functions. Script invocation. What I want it is the goal definitions. Yeah, built in object goals, loadable module goals, and exported symbols. Um, dependency tracking, maybe. Let's start with goal definitions. Yeah, that's for this, like for each subdirectory, you can specify what objects you want to be including for a given thing. Um, built in object goals. Um, don't have an arbitrary goal. Single library for that directory. Mm -hmm. I thought I was doing is specifying like um, a subdirectory or something. Dependency tracking. So I guess I am into the special rules bit, right? Okay, so here they have an example of building some header file. Um, so I can generate a header file to include in a C file that I might be able to use. Hmm. Let's see if there's an example of this. H. What do I have to escape here? I think I need to escape these. Nope. Let's, can we do something not in the boot directory? How about... That seems nicer. Yeah, I said make balance probably not particularly modern, but dev list. Okay. So they added an extra dependency for the object with a header, and then they added the clean files, they don't touch targets, and they have a header here, and they use a call. So we can do something similar. Let's say Let's say our LGDTM FGDTM plus equals compile um, test. .o. And then we do uh, clean files bad.h. And we'll have bad.h. Ironically, have a dependency on bad.c. We'll compile into bad.o, or um, we need to, I realize, remove object bad. No, sorry. If, if it succeeds, we have to remove it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. empty header file. Uh, and then we'll make compile tests be nothing interesting. Uh, and include bad.h. Maybe? Maybe this will work finally? Let's go look at the other example real quick in case I forgot something. Alright, clean files. What are you doing? 
doing an assignment. Uh, I'm not sure if I like that. Dot O, dot H, dot H, and it's dependencies. Dot O, I do not have the dot O. So, object, compile, test dot O, object, add dot H. Uh, clean files, I'll do a plus equals for the moment. Maybe, maybe. Let's try it. And then I think I'm going to call it uh, whether it works or not. Because I've been talking for two hours and I'm hungry. Ah! That's good. Now let's go back and look at the build. I mean, we got to clean this up, but okay, the, the, actual, <laughs> the actual thing ran, which is what we wanted. Uh, it ran with all the C flags expected for this directory, which is the other thing we wanted. Um, and then we've got bad.c actually getting built and blowing up. And then we, uh, uh, well, we removed it either way. But because that failed, we wrote that header file, which meant the cc of compile test happened. Uh, and we were happy. So that is one potentially hacky way to go about this. Um, and what I'm thinking is, this could actually be turned into, similar to CC option, this could be turned into a command to say, you know, what I really want to get is, uh, you know, uh, let's see, I want to be able to say something like, um, you know, call, uh, fail or something and then probably the C file as an argument so source dot C and then something like that where we go I want to compile this just like I was in a regular thing but of course the warning the error I want to detect in standard error is this specific warning and that should constitute a successful thingy and then we touch some file or something um, That'd be nice. That'd be the way I'd like to see it go. Um, so, okay, I'm happy with that. We have an example of this working. It's a little hacky, but we can start doing compile time tests of these various pieces now. Um, I think that'd be good. Uh, so we'll have the runtime side, the compile time side, and then we can get this working sensibly between both GCC and Clang and Fortify string S copy. Um, now, of course, the only tricky bit here is I'll have to extend this a bit, probably just to look at, instead of looking at the, the text here, actually probably have to look at the link failure type, and we'll have to do one test at a time, because Clang will only fail on the link side. Um, anyway, just have to expand the test a little bit more, um, instead of just doing the compilation time, since Clang is uh, not able to do, uh, to do the compilation assert uh, compile time, or is it, ah, yeah. So this thing, this is how it's implemented right now. It's called compile time error. Um, so what happens is GCC has a way to say, hey, blow up immediately while you're parsing this in your inliner or whatever. Um, but that happens late uh, in, in Clang's sort of compilation pass. So what we end up with is Compile time error disappears, and we get this un a defined read overflow that you can't link against. Uh, so I want to go show this really quickly. Yeah, so compiler GCC says do this error message. Clang doesn't have a way to do that, so the fallback for non-GCC. Uh, sorry, that's separate. Uh, right, is just to define it as uh, nothing. So you end up with an external. Um, you have to use it in a 
place where you define an external that doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't exist on link time. And then com compilation assert is very different. Um, sorry, uh, compile time warning versus assert. Anyway, uh, that's a mess. Uh, that's other things not worth really getting into right now. Uh, let me go look at, make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, so four to five versus string S copy we talked about at the beginning. Um, runtime testing we uh, looked at after that, and then we tested Fortify versus Clang and how to unwind that complexity and weirdness, um, although there's little bits we have to fix up along the way. And then doing compile time testing, which is looks pretty awkward, I gotta say. I'm hoping we can clean this up into something a little bit, a little bit nicer. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to talk about today. Uh, thank you for suffering through my shenanigans of trying to get this working in some fashion. Um, yeah, that's all I've got. Uh, if people have ideas about stuff they want to see or topics they want to cover, uh, email me, let me know. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign off for today. Thank you all for joining me and spending your couple hours with me watching this. Uh, I'm going to head out. So thanks very much. Uh, Second pipnet updates. Um, I am, even after last week's work on CPU sets, trying to get things working, I am still mucking around with getting C groups and CPU isolation working. Um, it's super duper awkward <laughs> to get it working on a sensible, um, in a sensible way because system D controls basically everything but CPU set. Uh, so do C to do CPU set management externally is weird. And I got the system into a place where it can't move the K threads out anymore. Anyway, there's still compli com complications, but, um, the, the development window is open for a while. I'm pretty sure we're, I'm just going to, take uh, take the set count bitmaps as is, but I'd, I'd prefer some clean performance numbers on, on real world um, loads. Uh, so I just want to get that done, but um, it takes a little while to iterate on that. Um, but we'll get there. Awesome. Thanks for, thanks for stopping by and um, take care. Bye-bye everybody.